Welcome back to the podcast. Uh, joining me today is Bill Nelson, the director and officer of the OT ISAC. Uh, we're going to talk about information sharing within OT, resilience, and probably most interestingly, um, exactly why we don't talk more about recovery these days in light of nonstop incidents uh, everywhere, not just in OT. So um, just a, a little bit about Bill. He's an industry veteran. He's the chairman of the Global Resilience Federation, which is a nonprofit hub for information sharing organizations such as the OT ISAC. Uh, Bill was also formerly president and CEO of the Financial Services ISAC and executive VP of NACHA, which is uh, the organization that oversees the automated clearinghouse network that uh, most of us are probably familiar with within financial services. So just a couple of housekeeping notes before we bring in Bill. Um, I want to thank you all again for the support. I urge you to subscribe and keep spreading the word about the podcast. Uh, I've been really fortunate to have some great guests and your interest and feedback uh, definitely helps keep this thing going. So I appreciate it. Um, Also, just a note that Clarity's research arm, Team 82, recently kicked off a new Slack channel where you can connect with our researchers, discuss their latest work, vulnerability disclosures, and anything uh, OT or IoT cybersecurity related. So I'll uh, include a a link in the show notes that you can use to join. Uh, So let's get going with today's podcast. I want to bring in Bill. Uh, Bill, thank you for for joining. I really appreciate uh, you giving me some time today. How are you? Good, and thank you for inviting me, Mike. Uh, Absolutely. So I know I did a little bit of an introduction on yourself, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about the OT ISAC um, and how it works closely with the the GRF and, you know, who some of the members are, some of the activities. Give, give us kind of a breakdown of the OT ISAC. Yeah, let's let's start at the beginning. Uh, the history goes back quite a few years. I, I left NACHA at the end of 2005 and joined the organization, the Financial Services Information Sharing and Analysis Center in 2006 as their CEO. And uh, information sharing was our middle name. I did not see a lot of information sharing going on when I joined in 2006. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I used to joke that we uh, throw a party when somebody shared something. Uh, it It was interesting that near the end of 2006, we got this request for information from another ISAC called the Multistate ISAC. And it concerned a Chinese brute force attack. And, and they basically asked, hey, has anybody seen this? And I shared that with our members. And we got four responses back, which was uh, a record. <laughs> and uh, they said, yeah, we've seen the same attack in, in the financial services sector. It must have been a big deal. That was a big deal. That was the <laughs> first big party I threw, I think, and uh, celebrated. Um, basically, a party of one, me and the, uh, we had an outsourced operation at the time. Um, we grew uh, from a few hundred members at FSISAC when I joined, all U.S.-based, to over 7,000 companies by the time I left uh, in 2018 in 50 countries. And they were you know, banks, but also uh, credit unions, broker-dealers, insurance companies, payment processors, uh, and uh, any, anybody, any company that had anything to do with uh, finance. Right. So the need for it had really grown and the attacks had really picked up. Uh, I'd say 2009 and 10, we started to see a lot of account takeover attacks, which are basically attacks against companies. Uh, basically click on a, a phished email and you get a banking Trojan on your system and they take over your online banking, uh, uh, I guess, uh, platform basically, and, and they get in and, and steal money. They were sending wires and ACHs uh, all over the world, mostly mm-hmm. wires. And that ended up uh, bringing us in, in uh, a lot of focus with the FBI, uh, Secret Service, started to work closely with them, uh, also started to work with uh, uh, Department of Homeland Security more and other sectors. And this affected all industries because it wasn't just, it wasn't targeting banks, it was targeting the bank customers. And uh, that was something different, too. Uh, we, we saw business email compromises. We saw um, DDoS attacks, distributed denial of service attacks. 
and then of course ransomware. Um, in about the 2014-15 timeframe, <clears throat> I got a request from uh, some law firms to join FSISAC. And I said, well, you're not a bank, you're not an insurance company, uh, you're not a broker, sorry. But they, they were very persistent being law firms. And um, there they was their CISOs, uh, Chief Information Security Officers and CIOs that were making the request. Eventually, we allowed them to join and we created a separate division called the Sector Services Division. Uh, they joined, uh, we stood up a retail group. There were a number of uh, attacks against retailers. I don't know if you remember the Target attack or Home Depot. Sure. And then uh, oil and gas uh, had had an ISAC, had floundered. Uh, we got we helped them get that restarted. Um, by 2017, I made the decision, recommendation to my board that maybe we should spin this off as a separate company. And they agreed with that. Uh, by then, we had another energy group. We called it Ease Energy Analytics Security Exchange joined. Uh, healthcare ISAC joined. We were providing services on the physical side to uh, FS ISAC. And by 2018, uh, the National Retail Federation had joined. Um, so we had a, a, a pretty good group to start off with this GRF of about seven members. Um, I joined the organization. I left FSISAC at the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. And uh, we added downstream natural gas, another uh, energy group. And then OTISAC was created. OTISAC uh, was a request from the cybersecurity agency of Singapore to help them uh, have an information sharing model for Singapore and really all of Asia. And we uh, focused around OT and uh, the 11 different sectors that they identified uh, that would be part of it, things like maritime, manufacturing, healthcare, uh, you know, retail, et cetera, all sectors except finance because I had started an organization in Singapore to focus on finance, working with the monetary authority there already. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, so we didn't want to duplicate that effort. So OT ISAC was really designed to focus on operational technologies and the effect uh, that cyber attacks might have on those or other types of attacks, industrial control systems, SCADA systems, et cetera. And that took off and we had big plans for it. Uh, of course, COVID hit in 2020. Uh, that hampered our ability to travel, uh, you know, across Southeast Asia and the rest of Asia and uh, Australia and India and, you know, uh, around the world to, to uh, promote it. But we have been able to increase the membership uh, even without, uh, even with the travel ban in the last uh, three years. So uh, we have about uh, almost four dozen members now uh, from around the world. We have some in the U.S. that have joined, uh, some in the Middle East. Um, Australia, uh, and uh, of course, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, more of the, the local uh, groups there. Uh, hopefully with Omicron and, and uh, maybe the decline of uh, uh, COVID's uh, uh, lethal uh, aspect of it, uh, we, we can see more travel and uh, more promotion of the OTA set going forward. I hopefully, should, yeah. yeah. Starting yeah. to turn around, hopefully, yeah. Yes, I should mention that we have added some other sectors to this Global Resilience Federation umbrella, uh, including professional services. I can mention a member of that, that's KPMG. There's about three other, uh, or three or four others. Uh, the major uh, consulting firms have joined that. Um, we also added the Space ISAC. We're <laughs> providing su support for them. Aviation ISAC, a K-12 Security Information Exchange, which is uh, school districts. Uh, in terms of uh, just this year, we're adding uh, the uh, REN ISAC, which is higher education, and then uh, manufacturing and the auto ISAC. So we've added, we're adding three in, in the next uh, few months. So this is about 15, to, and we have another group called the Business Resilience Council, and I'll talk more about that later, but uh, around operational resilience. So that's a multi-sector group. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it, it's a broad group, a lot of cross-sector sharing going on. Uh, a lot of that benefits uh, OTISAC members. And of course, uh, what OTISAC shares is also benefiting uh, the rest of these uh, different industry groups. So with respect to OTISAC, is there a typical persona that, that joins as a member in terms of indi individuals? I guess what I'm asking is how much security expertise are these people coming in with? Or are they asset owners and operators that, you know, security is definitely not their day job? 
who's a typical uh, person that joins? Yeah, we're seeing uh, a lot of people that are on the uh, IT security side mm-hmm. are participating. And, you know, I think one of the, the big uh, challenges is getting the OT folks, you know, the engineers and the IT folks together and, and speaking the same language, <laughs> if you will. Sure. And uh, that's, a, that's a big challenge. I think that's, that's, that's it's one of the major ones. Uh, it's interesting. Um, there was a, a fellow in, in uh, the Netherlands. I was I was there uh, in 2019 for a conference, and he had developed a, a, almost a um, translation guide of the NIST cybersecurity standards uh, for OT professionals. He kind of translated everything and terminology that they would understand. Uh, I think that that type of um, understanding and, and having the same uh, terminology mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and understanding is an important uh, role. So typically we are getting uh, some IT folks and OT folks together uh, from the same organizations and getting them to talk to each other is another challenge. Uh, but uh, I think it's uh, s- certainly needed with some of the uh, attacks that we've seen against OT uh, infrastructure. Yeah, that, that's true. And that kind of common knowledge base, I would imagine, would be really valuable to to OT, given kind of just a general struggle with with cybersecurity. Um, you know, I did a podcast a couple of weeks ago with uh, Tom Van Norman, and we talked about you know the skill shortage in, in terms of cybersecurity and OT. And um, it would seem that you know any kind of mutual sharing of information. Um, you know, however, it's anonymized, et cetera, will be incredibly beneficial. And I, I assume you're you're seeing some of those challenges in terms of you know getting some of those early wins, like you deal with the FA, FS ISAC. Yeah, we are, and I think um, I think the, the, the big thing to understand is uh, sharing of information is not a competitive issue. Mm. And I remember at, at FS ISAC we had. Uh, I won't name the names. It was a, it was a major bank, several major banks would not share initially. And they felt it was a competitive advantage that their security was better than their competitors. Now that's uh, simply wasn't necessarily the case. I don't believe, but uh, uh, there were two large institutions in New York that made the decision about 2007 that they would start sharing everything. Uh, and they assigned people on their staff that was their only job was to share information about attacks as they were occurring. You know, indicators of compromise, you know, like attacking IP addresses or uh, the executable file that uh, is being used to, that has malware in it. Um, you know, maybe the subject line of a uh, an email that was used for phishing, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And that was a big change. When they started doing that, then the other financial institutions saw it and they said they were able to stop attacks. They realized the benefit and almost shamed them into uh, sharing themselves. And they did. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, I was at, um, I was visiting one of the chief information security officers at one of the banks uh, that had formerly been against information sharing, uh, but they were not anymore. They were sharing a lot. And I was in their office in, uh, uh, happened to be in North Carolina. I won't name the bank, but you can, deduce it might, who it might be, but uh, there's several uh, banks there, but uh, major ones. And he had to leave the office for a second and go to a war room. They were being attacked. And I waved to the people in the war room. And I went back to his office and waited. And I checked my, my iPhone. I looked at it. Sure enough, there was an alert uh, about an attack and they had already shared it. <laughs> so as uh, on, almost online real time. And I think that's awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. That that's probably one of the best examples of it. I have other ones where, you know, we had a uh, we had a, one of our first meetings of the legal services information sharing community, and it was in Washington D.C. In fact, it was our first meeting, and the, the it was a Tuesday. We're having the meeting. The Friday before, I was driving home. I get this. Uh, well, I, I wasn't checking my I, when I got home. I checked my <laughs> my device, and it said. Uh, there was an attack that uh, a, a, uh, a vendor had found that was pending against 34 law firms. And they had all the information about who they were attacking, their LinkedIn addresses, their Facebook uh, information, et cetera, emails. And what turned out was we were able to notify over the weekend 
all 34 law firms. Now, it just so happened that 27 of them had joined our legal services group already. They were some of the largest ones. And uh, the other seven we notified, even though they weren't members. Uh, and they, they ended up all joining as a result of that. And they, everybody was able to stop the attacks. Uh, on Tuesday, when we had the meeting, everybody kind of looked at us and said, I think we understand how information sharing is beneficial. <laughs> and uh, so that was that was a great example. It doesn't happen every day. We, right. Um, but um, I think the OT challenges are a little bit different in that, um, you know, many, many, I guess, asset critical infrastructure owners, you know, focus on backup of operational data. Um you know, maybe it's regulatory requirements, or maybe just you know they just want to have backup, and but the system backups are not not necessarily performed regularly, and and your protection for uh, recovery, um, do you have enough security controls to um, to really prevent uh, or really recover uh, during a major cyber incident? Uh, have you tested them? And then you mentioned the lack of on-site, maybe technical expertise. Right. Uh, and OT is a real challenge. Uh, you have a, an incident that occurs. Uh, you may not have the technical expertise in-house for incident recovery. Uh, it's not present. And then when you rely on your provider of that uh, OT service, um, that may be remotely delivered, and that may delay recovery eff- efforts also. And then, of course, you know, having a business resilience plan is great or a crisis management plan. But um, can do you have the uh, have you tested it? Uh, I, I've talked to some companies that have actually gone the, the uh, I don't know, the extra mile and, and turn their uh, main core systems off uh, OT and IT mm-hmm. and, and tested their uh, OT and IT backup uh, or recovery systems. That that's the ultimate test to do that. Uh, most have not done that. I'm actually only run, run across a handful that have, and uh, that's I think where the next stage is in, in true uh, operational resilience is to be able right. to recover. I, I, one more information sharing question in terms of you know you mentioned some of the the hesitancy in other ISACs, whether it's a competitive, they, they believe they'd be at a competitive disadvantage or just not wanting to admit that they had been breached. Are, are you seeing some of those same struggles or hesitancy within OT, within the OT ISAC right now? Uh, I, I, I think it's, uh, I wouldn't call it a struggle. I think it's a learning process mm-hmm. and they start to learn what the benefits are. And it's not all about member to member sharing too. Um, when I look at it, I, I see that you know we're getting information from government partners that we're providing. Uh, that provides pretty valuable information. We're getting it from other sectors, uh, and we're getting it from intelligence vendors uh, and companies uh, in the OT space uh, and the IT space that are providing information about vulnerabilities uh, in particular, um, and of course prioritizing them and making sure you patch those or in the case of device vulnerabilities, making sure those are addressed uh, with your vendor. Right. So that's that's become a, a real value add and being part of an information sharing community. It's not about just member to member sharing. It's it's about uh, there's really four pillars to this. It's the member to member part. It's the government and, and public private sector partnership. It's the cross sector sharing, and it's the the uh, you know contacts with the vendors. And we've had a number of tax in uh, a number of these other different spaces. Uh, I remember when uh, RSA had uh, difficulties with their, uh, their, uh, their little fob that you had for two-factor authentication. Uh, it was easily compromised uh, f- a few years ago. Uh, we had RSA on the calls to discuss mm-hmm. that. Uh, the same with some of the, the vendors that we've dealt with uh, in uh, legal services that have had some uh, breaches uh, or some vulnerabilities. Uh, Log4j was another example of a vulnerability, a uh, recent one where we've had special meetings in basically each of our industry groups to discuss it and talk about um, uh, the vendors that they're dealing with and making sure that those uh, vulnerabilities are patched or, or uh, uh, fixed. Mm-hmm. And so of those four pillars, do you 
prioritize any of those over the other, or would you like to see improvement in the member to member, for example? Well, yeah, I think the member to member is 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 still the most challenging. Sure. Uh, I would say government was a big challenge here in the U.S. for a long time, and it still is a challenge in many governments around the world. And I'll give you uh, two examples of that. Um, one was, uh, and, and this is public information. We generally don't talk about um, in individual companies, but mm-hmm. NASDAQ had a, a breach a number of years ago, and uh, they, uh, they wanted to share the information. Uh, they didn't uh, because they shared it with their uh, regulator. And the next day, about 42 people showed up at their offices with the FBI and uh, local police and all these other regulators showed up. And the FBI told them, don't share it. Now, this was in 2009. Okay. So um, FBI has changed their attitude about this significantly. They, they're sharing directly. If they find out about any attack, they share it. Right. Uh, so that's changed. But back then, they were not sharing. I was giving a speech a couple of years ago in um, Belgium, and uh, there were um, various uh, information sharing bodies and, and uh, uh, from around Europe at that meeting and uh, banking associations and other groups, uh, payments uh, companies. And, uh, you know, there were several, well, more than a few of the uh, uh, countries said their police department, it's a black hole. You, you give information to the government, you never get anything back and they never give you anything. <laughs> that was, and that used to be the complaint about the U.S. government. For it's, sure. It's still a problem uh, maybe with somebody, if there's some... Uh, changes in personnel, it still can be a problem in some agencies. It's, but it's more of a problem internationally uh, with getting your government partner to share. Um, but yeah, that, that's still a problem. I think the vendors are definitely willing to share and we have a lot of close vendor relationships. Uh, I think that's uh, critical and I think Clarity is, is one of them. And uh, we're looking forward to continue to, to work with you and uh, helping, helping our members and your customers. Yeah, it's it's really interesting that, you know, it kind of takes a major incident or a, something like that to to bring folks to the same table. And I'm just curious, like when a, a colonial or Oldsmar breaks in the news, just, you know, is it a fire drill of, of requests for help from your members all of a sudden? Or do you have to be proactive and, and kind of bring them to the table and and disperse information? But what, what happens when a major incident breaks? Yeah, it is a uh, I, that's a great description of fire drill. It, uh, Colonial and Oldsmar were 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 great case studies, uh, particularly in the OT space. Uh, you know, you have a ransomware attack, which is an IT attack. Yeah, and all of a sudden you have no gasoline and petroleum products being delivered throughout the whole East Coast, and it, it created a really kind of a, a you know, very major uh, event. Um, there have been other cases where. Um, electric companies, uh, I know in, uh, in South Africa have been attacked and, uh, also, but you, know, you think, well, that didn't have any impact. Well, it did because it ended up, uh, the billing system was affected and all of a sudden people's electricity were cut off because they didn't get any bills to pay. And there was, uh, and the other one was Merck. I, I, I looked back at Merck a few years ago. Sure. Um, you know, they were, uh, they really crippled their operations uh, estimated over $300 million in losses. But I liked what their CEO did, though, in response to that. You know, they had their email system was wiped. I mean, all their uh, systems, accounts receivable, accounts payable. I mean, everything was was basically uh, not necessarily wiped. It was a rans- it, it was called a ransomware attack, although there was no ransom to pay. And it was just a, clearly a nation state attack that mm-hmm. got out of control. And uh, he told his staff around the world, they, they put everybody on WhatsApp, so they could communicate. And they said, we don't care what it takes. Um, just keep your customer happy. Don't come to the home office for approval. Just just say yes and get things done uh, to address their needs. Now that cost them money, but I thought that was the appropriate upper management response to that, that type of incident. And uh, I saw a similar thing a number of years ago with Heartland Payment Systems. Uh, probably worth a, a quick minute to talk about um, sure. uh, the Heartland, their CEO is a guy named Bob Carr and he allows me to use his name and uh, he, I've had, I've given him awards and stuff because of his reaction, but 
know, they had 120 million credit cards stolen uh, or breached. And his response was, you know, he lawyered up at first and then he ignored the lawyers. And lawyers told him, don't, don't say anything, don't say anything. Well, wait a minute. So he went out and said, hey, we were breached. This is what happened. They had actually had a, uh, uh, you know, a, a whole um, assessment of their payment system. Uh, and uh, it was on his desk, the draft that said everything was clean when they found the breach. So <laughs> a lot of good the assessment did. But um, he went out and he just opened his kimono and shared all the information about the attack, the indicators compromised, the tactics used. Uh, he had uh, their vendor, it was Mandiant, who came in and uh, disclosed, uh, actually it was Kevin Mandiant actually showed up at one of our meetings and uh, shared all the information. We formed a special group of payment processors to, to uh, start sharing information in the future. His complaint was payment processors knew he was breached, other ones. Um, the FBI did, um, the, uh, oh God, the, the attorney general did, and they, nobody told him. Now that's since changed. They have an information sharing group and that does that and the FBI will share it with anybody that is, that they know it's attacked, uh, is attacked. So that's all changed. But a year later, year after the attack, when the stock had taken a big dip, one year later, he, his stock price was higher than it was before the breach and he hadn't lost a single customer because of his transparency and he kept his job. Right. <laughs> I look at, and there's a whole slew of companies like Target or Equifax or others where, you know, the CISO gets fired, CAO gets fired, and the CEO gets fired. <laughs> and so it's, uh, if you want to clam up and, and lawyer up, I, I'll, I'll power to you because, you know, you're going to... There, there's a price, absolutely. You're going to suffer, I think. Yeah. I think that's the wrong way to go about it. Yeah. And, uh, I, I don't take the, uh, uh, the the PR approach just to clam up. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you you owe your customers more, if, yeah. if nothing else. Well, the customers, the public, the government. Yeah. I mean, you're going to be in congressional hearings. I mean, Bob and I were in a couple of hearings, uh, in Congress and the Senate, um, and as a result of that, and uh, you know, they they wanted to hear about it, and he was open, mm -hmm. and they they didn't castigate him for that. So. Right. So you brought it up earlier, and I, I want to just jump into a discussion about. Um, uh, about resilience. And you mentioned, and we spoke the other day briefly about, you know, just what we were going to talk about on the podcast. And you mentioned this operational resilience framework. Um, tell everybody a little bit about, you know, what, what's involved there. And, and I definitely want that to lead into a discussion about, you know, recovery from incidents and why we don't talk about recovery more um, within this industry. Yeah, let's, uh, yeah, there was, a, there was actually a data scientist, a guy named Sunil Yu, who developed a cyber defense matrix and he looked at all, you know, the five aspects of um, NIST uh, in terms of cybersecurity, you know, identity, uh, protection, detection, response, and recovery. And in the identity and protection detection area, there are literally, you know, hundreds of um, vendors out there and companies that can help you with that and provide solutions. Response, there's some, you know, there's maybe a few dozen uh, and certainly that's a, a role of ISACs, um, and particularly around uh, devices and, and networks uh, and, and uh, a little bit in data. In recovery, there's, in, in, there's data backup solutions, but what about, what about the other areas uh, like devices, applications, networks, um, and the degree of dependency you have on humans, people, rather than technology. Mm -hmm. And when you really ask the question, um, how do you recover not just data, but applications, systems, including OT systems, networks, devices, uh, and arch system architecture and its configurations. And that is not something that there's one solution you go to and, and pick to do. And um, can there be a, a distributed and immutable way to recover? Because a lot of times your data backup might be infected too. Sure. And uh, if your devices are, you know, wiped, uh, then how do you how do you respond to that? So what we're trying to do is is develop and and we're well on the way to developing this, by the way, uh, and promulgate a cross sector kind of industry driven framework of rules and. Uh, my background, uh, it was at NACHA for 
18 years, a rulemaking body for the automated clearinghouse network, things like direct deposit. Well, we made that work because all the banks agreed to the rules, the banks and credit unions, and the Federal Reserve adopted those rules as the, one of the principal operators, and the, the clearinghouse in New York also adopted them. So you were obligated to follow those NACHA operating rules that were developed by industry. And um, so what we're trying to do is provide con continuity and recovery of critical data systems and processes. So that would minimize service disruption. It's not going to say it's going to eliminate it, but uh, to customers, business partners, counterparties, et cetera. And I think that's, uh, you know, in light of some of the, you know, destructive and uh, attacks we've seen and we're continuing to see, um, you know, I think this is really needed. So I think this idea of a set of rules is something that we have out of our business resilience council and our work group uh, um, is, uh, you know, that's chaired by, co-chaired by uh, an individual from MetLife and another one from American Express. The person that heads up this effort for operational resilience is the executive chairman of Lewis and Clark Bank out in Portland. And uh, he's also a uh, uh, technology uh, genius. <laughs> so it's a, uh, uh, he's wearing a couple different hats here, but he's chairing this group and we're working it uh, with our members and some interested parties, including some of the uh, major iCloud providers and, and, and others. Uh, but the first thing is you need to do is what's your impact tolerance uh, quantifying, you know, um, the amount of disruption that could be tolerated, if you will, as a result of one of these destructive or adverse uh, events. And you want to do that for every operational critical service or business critical service. And um, that, that could impact, uh, again, your business, your customers, your business parties or counterparties. And that's, uh, that's a big effort. So we're looking at um, processes uh, around recovery and restoration of user data, business data, uh, devices, processes, applications, network systems, and, and core services. So uh, it's it's a it's a big effort, and we're, uh, interestingly, we're well on the way of completing the first round of it and getting ready to go out for uh, industry commentary and refinement um, in this quarter. And next quarter, second quarter, we should have a public comment and publishing by the end of second quarter. Uh, we're, we're that far away. Uh, we're that close to it. That's great, and uh, I'm excited about it because I, it's a it's a it's a learning process too. This will continue over the next years, uh, so updates could be made to this as the uh, industry changes or new new factors are are considered. We'll be uh, updating these rules on it, yeah. uh, at least an annual basis. What I'm hearing out of that too, from an OT uh, perspective, is that once you you know once an organization implements this framework or follows it. There's a lot of internal stakeholders that are going to have to be involved in in, in recovery, and um, you know I think that that's really going to nudge a lot of companies forward in terms of security and and locking down critical systems and understanding you know their risk tolerance. Yeah, I, I look at it as um, you know implementing processes to uh, enable you to have system recovery and and reconstitution of of your ot systems and yep. that's uh that could be difficult that's going to require uh certainly some communication with uh some of your ot system providers your technology providers and uh devices um you know i think in testing of this is going to be key too right so um again we're it's flexible we're not saying you have to do you you determine your own impact tolerance within your own organization mm -hmm. you say well geez i can be down for you know uh two months with my accounts receivable system it doesn't matter well that seems like a long time though but uh or maybe it's <laughs> two weeks or, or one month uh but these other critical systems i can't be down for more than let's say 24 hours right or less and those are the ones you focus and make a uh, have your highest degree of uh, uh, or lowest degree of impact tolerance, uh, and and uh, need to address the first. So before we wrap up, I definitely wanted to kind of have a just a, a general cyber discussion, um, and specifically, I mean, we don't have to go through the gory details of Colonial and JBS and Oldsmar again, but 
just want to get your opinion on kind of the long-term outcomes of those incidents as, in, as they relate to OT. Um, are you seeing these incidents having the greatest benefit in terms of awareness, improving risk management, or is it, you know, just the outcome of the U S government, for example, getting, you know, awakened to this, um, to these issues through executive orders, mandating disclosures, mandating S bombs, the whole bit, um, you know, there were real threats to economic security, national security, public safety with some of these incidents. What do you see as some of the kind of the long-term outcomes of those? Yeah, I, I think uh, I would, I'm not a big fan of government intervention and, right. and the regulation, but I think there is a knee-jerk reaction when some of these big incidents occur and you hear about Colonial Pipeline for, you know, it's in the news every day, press is, uh, is making a big deal out of it, uh, you know, creating you know, fear, uncertainty, doubt, and, and, uh, and then you've got um, congressional hearings and Senate hearings. Uh, and, and then it fades away until the next incident pops up. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, why didn't we do this already? And uh, you know, there's been a, been a lot of issues around um, what is effective and, and just reporting to the government things that happen. And I've seen this in some, I won't point, point out any specific countries, but uh, there's some requirements in, in some countries that you have to report incidents when the next number of hours. Yeah. And, and that's that's to me. You don't even know what what the result of the incident is. You know, you've been there's been some data exfiltration. Generally, you don't know right away what's been exfiltrated. You might never know if it's encrypted. Um, yeah, it's not fair to the victim. You're it's right. Not. And uh, there's a lot of uh, you, you got to remember these are victims, and um, you know I think there's there needs to be more uh, done to protect them. I think there's more that the um, uh, different sectors can do uh, to protect their um, infrastructures. And uh, I, I know um, here in the U.S., there are many different ISACs, uh, communications ISAC, electricity ISAC, and others that are, are doing more, um, and, and their, their members are doing more to protect uh, their infrastructure against, against these types of attacks. Mm-hmm. And the government's done a good job in releasing uh, some guidelines uh, for the water sector, transportation sector, and others, uh, and they're continuing to do that. I think that's that's great news. Uh, you have to, you know, you can you have to uh, force the the horse to drink the water, though, right? <laughs> you, can, you can lead it to them, but they got to drink it. Sure. So the uh, these different uh, industries need to, to step up and as individual companies and say, hey, this is a priority. And it needs to be done at the board level, um, and uh, you know, I think whacking them with fines is not the right approach. Uh, I, I think, uh, I think, in, you know, I think the incentive, your stock price is going to take a big hit. <laughs> There's other incentives and you're going to lose customers if people don't feel secure in dealing with you. Um, so I, I think there's some natural uh, marketplace incentives for you to uh, have a higher level of cybersecurity right. uh, and protection of your OT assets in particular. All right. So one final question, Bill, I, and this has been a really um, informative discussion. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to join me today. Um, just give you a chance to kind of, you know, explain what's up for uh, OTI SAC for, for this year or one month into 2022. Um, I'm sure you've got some exciting initiatives coming up for the year. Maybe you can just kind of give us a preview of, of a couple of them as we wrap up. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the things that we're uh, working our team there, um, John Lee, who's a you know, really OT expert and our analysts, uh, we are offering now uh, risk assessments uh, if you join. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they, are, they will come in and, and, and do an assessment for you and work with you uh, and working with some of our, our uh, partners uh, in doing that. So uh, that, that's something I'm excited about. Uh, the information sharing groups that we have include, you know, threat intelligence, regular meetings that they have within OTISAC. Uh, we also continue to have uh, emergency uh, calls when needed um, around major events. So I think uh, to be part of the group and be a member, I think is um, you're going to be left behind if, uh, uh, if you're not there. And we're all in this together and, and getting peer input and assistance 
uh, I think is the biggest benefit. You know, what what is everybody else doing to address, let's say, a new vulnerability in an OT system? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and finding out uh, maybe some things that you couldn't find out by just Googling it or whatever or, or contacting your vendor and, uh, and, and getting those vendors to uh, uh, show up when there is a major attack, I think collectively having, you know, uh, dozens and dozens of uh, customers uh, approach the vendor uh, is provides incentive them for, uh, and you try to do that on your own, you might not be able to, to have a, uh, a discussion with them. Um, right. This, this enables you through the power of this collective, this uh, co- collective community to, uh, to get them to the table. So I think that's, those are the main things. We have a, a conference coming up in the, uh, later this year. Uh, uh, hopefully it's an in-person conference. Hopefully. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I, you know, I, I look forward to it. I, hopefully I'll be able to come to it. Great. Yeah. Definitely some great benefits that, that people should be taking advantage of. All right, Bill, thank you again so much for, for joining. It's been a good conversation and uh, maybe we can do it again. Okay, Mike. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.